So let's get started for this lovely Monday, Operating Systems, Lecture 8, Main Memory or Memory Management. I hate starting in the middle of a lecture, so I'll review a little bit to see what we started, but I know we stopped here on continuous memory allocation. And if we could keep the noise down, it would be great so I don't have to feel like I'm yelling over people. Um, all right, so this chapter is Chapter 8, and a couple people have already asked me, well, what's the best way of studying for the final exam? Well, read the book. <laughs> That's the best. That's the only one thing I can tell you is really. I'm giving you a snapshot version of all these chapters. I'm not giving you the entire chapter. I will have a review session, however, the week before. Oh, now it got quiet. A week before the final exam so that you guys know what to study. Definitely, we're going to have some main memory questions on there. Main memory is the memory that is used to run the processes. And so today we're going to go over the main memory, memory algorithms. You don't have to implement a main memory algorithm. Instead, you'll be comparing. Uh, different types of memory allocation schemes in a paper that you'll be writing for one of the assignments. And I'll go over the assignment at the end of today as well. But you don't necessarily have to implement this, which is a big time saver for some people who are looking at the assignments going, man, these are hard. Not this one. This one's pretty easy. This one is just a paper. So last time I introduced the first part of the chapter, giving you some definitions about the different types of memories and how they're used on the computer system. Yes? The 19th. Monday, the 19th of August, I believe, if I remember this correctly. <laughs> and I'm going to put the EM1. You can take the EM. If you're in both classes, the operating systems and engineering management, they'll both be offered on the 19th. And then on the Wednesday, I'll be offering them again. I'd like you to take them on the 19th, but I'm going to hold it on both days at the same class hours. So you can optionally take, you can optionally take it on the 19th, or you can optionally take it on the Wednesday, right after. So I would, if I were, I'd do one on the 19th and one on Wednesday, one on Monday, one on Wednesday, just break it out a little bit. But I'll be holding both of them. I don't know exactly the hours yet on the 19th. I'm going to try to do them in the morning back to back, so you don't have to come at two o'clock in the afternoon on the Wednesday. I'll just do it in the morning. It'll be like in the makeup session for both exams. Or you can come and take them both on the same day if you'd like, on the Wednesday or the Monday. So, um, but I'll have more details relating to that as we get closer. And the details, I, I already have the dates picked out. I just don't know what time on Wednesday yet. <laughs> so it depends on when the, uh, I have to have the proctoring people here at the university administer it because they do surveys and stuff at the same time. So I have to see when they're available and when they'd be agreed to do it. So I'm pretty sure they'll be accommodating, so. Anyway, back to my memory. So we talked about the concept of the different levels of the hierarchy of memory, cache memory versus main memory, and registers, and how we get closer to the CPU is more expensive but smaller. Farther away from the CPU is cheaper and larger. Um, the largest and the most ex uh, inexpensive form of memory, again, is secondary storage which is a hard drive and um, SD cards and stuff like that, uh, USB drives. Those are cheaper and bigger and farther away from the CPU, and they're also slower So, in terms of access speed. Um, so that's what we covered on the last lecture, and we also looked at the concept of the MMU being used to translate a logical to a physical address, and then the steps in the processing of a user program. The concepts versus logical and physical memory addressing, which is the translation that we're going to get from the MMU. And then from, from the operating system's perspective, we just read the MMU. We don't actually go out. The operating system doesn't go out and read the physical RAM that's on the system. That would be impossible. We wouldn't know the address spacing. We wouldn't know anything about it. So instead, what we do, or what we do is essentially come back and uh, create a logical representation sometimes also referred to as virtual memory or virtual addressing. So we have logical address, virtual logical memory, virtual address, virtual memory, physical address, physical memory. <laughs> so those are the terms that are used for this. Um, in terms of the MMU, um, it's giving us our logical representation. So it's a little translation. And we went through the kind of the, uh, the dynamic relocation using that lo relocation register. Covered this last time. So the CPU would look at this as the MMU right here, and then it, the MMU would translate the logical to the physical for us. If this is pretty standardized, which it is on most, um, most computer systems, then the operating system just needs to go to here. This is controlled by your hardware, so we don't need to worry about that. 
because uh, memory comes from all sorts of different vendors and it's all addressed differently and it's all in different sizes. It's also another important note, however, to make that the operating system only uses what it sees from the MMU, so which is actually kind of an interesting phenomena that occurs with this MMU. MMU sets the speed, sets the size, sets the location and the allocation and the mapping for us. So if we've got a computer system and it only takes four gigs of RAM and it works at, you know, speed A, and then we go out and we say, oh, I'm going to upgrade my RAM chip, so I'm going to put some better RAM in there, and I put speed B or something higher in there. MME only reads speed A. It doesn't really matter what you stick over here. You're still going to read the same speed that the MMU is designed to read at because you're not reading it from here, you're reading it from here which is actually kind of interesting so long story short don't put memory in there that's faster than your MMU actually supports because it's not going to do you any good unfortunately what ends up happening is the memory that was originally designed for your computer is only around when your computer is brand new years later when you go to upgrade your memory is outdated and actually it's more expensive to buy the older memory but people would pay extra to buy older memory for their computer that runs slower and is smaller because you'll get better performance out of it. <laughs> you'll get better performance out of a slow chip that is uh, old technology, but it is designed for your MMU that your computer specification says that this is what it wants. Give it what it wants. You'll get better performance out of it. What ends up happening with the faster chips you put in there, the newer, the better, you know, the cheaper, actually. This is not going to read it right. <laughs> There's a possibility it's not going to read it right, and then it's going to downclock it to what it can read it at. Because the hardware is configured for the speed that it's expecting. So then you have to go and translate it, and then you're going to have bottleneck that's going to happen with the MMU because this is running too fast. Long story short, faster is not better. <laughs> it's what the MMU wants. Knowing that, too, is that if this only takes 4 gigs, then your computer manufacturer will tell you how many gigs the thing will take. You put 8 gigs in here, it's still only going to read 4 gigs. The other four gigs is going to get dusty. It will only read what the MMU is designed to read. So don't put more RAM on your system than your system can handle either. Because then again, that also causes problems. If it only reads four, then it only reads four. And then that eight gig chip is going to cause problems. Because just the same way as it's too fast for the system, well, there's too much there. It's going to cause mapping issues, long story short, eventually. It might be intermittent mapping issues. It might work just fine, but it's going to work slower than if you just put four gigs on there. So so anyway, that's a common classic thing, and that's why people spend a lot of money. You know, go on eBay to buy old memory. Buy the old memory. Buy what your computer wants, what the MMU is expecting, even if you have to pay a little bit more for it, and it's outdated. Either that or don't upgrade and buy a new computer. <laughs> so This weekend I was telling everybody to buy MacBooks. It's actually kind of funny. So. Um, so today I'm telling you to buy newer computers. <laughs> don't buy old RAM, buy new computers. So... All right, dynamic loading. <coughs> so also covered static and dynamic loading. Dynamic loading loads at runtime. So it's the runtime uh, that is not loaded until it is called. Uh, it's a little bit more efficient so in terms of using main memory. So when we talk about main memory and we consider the mapping and we consider all of the characteristics of how it's being used by the operating system, that's when the static and dynamic terminology comes into place. Because it's a shared resource among all of the other, well, among the operating system, but also all of the other processes that are running on the system. We want to minimize how much we're using and then maximize how much we're reusing. So dynamic loading allows us to do that. Um, so that's where we get that DLL concept from in uh, Windows. So I think it started with XP or so, um, or something very close to the XP time frame where everything became a DLL. So the operating system loaded one version of all of the drivers and all of the utilities that it needed, put it up into memory, and then you dynamically, out, dynamically link an address in the program code to go use that DLL. So the problem with Windows and the problem with you know the Microsoft concept originally was everything was static. So if everything was statically allocated, it was allocated before runtime and your program source code included extra stuff that was being used by other programs, but your program um, needed it. So it was statically linked. So libraries like standard IO, IO, you know, IO stream .h, whatever, um, all your third-party libraries, everything was statically linked originally before about XP era. 
And then what ended up happening is you had really big files and you had a lot of files and it was very memory intense. And then memory grew and we got a lot of memory. But at the same time we decided, well, let's be more conservative with the memory. So there are third-party libraries, your system libraries, your Microsoft Foundation classes. Take them out of your executable. Instead, put them into a form of a DLL. Load the DLL once. All the programs link to the same memory address, which is more efficient than each program loading their own version of the same library, which is what was happening. So on a static allocation and a static linking scheme, everything's in the executable file. Everything gets loaded in the process space. And everybody gets their own copy of everything. In a dynamic, you delay it till you're loading it, or delay it until you're you're going to link it dynamically and then load it dynamically, usually. And in that particular case, then you're going to your program is going to load up and it's going to go. Well, I need this module, or I need this library. Is it loaded already? Go out and look. Oh, yeah, it is loaded. Okay, let's link it. So the linking part associates the location where it is with memory with your program code. So your process can actually link to it. Linking is the concept of creating the association. Allocating is loading it up. So if it's dynamically allocated, that means it waits until it uses it. If your program never reaches the line of code that loads the library, the library will never be loaded. So there's a difference between the loading and the linking and the dynamic loading, and these are terms you want to be familiar with because on the final exam I will be asking you, you know, dynamic loading is, dynamic linking is, and these are forms of multiple choice questions. So it may be dynamic loading and linking work in the such and such environment because of this, true or false or something, or I don't know. But loading is loading the library, allocating the memory, loading it up, making it available to the program code. Linking is finding it in memory and taking kind of like a pointer recording the address where it's located at and making it part of your program that's running. So they're very similar in concept, but dynamic linking, that's the DLL. The DLL stands for dynamically linked library. It means it's linked at runtime. Anything dynamic happens after the program compilation happens. Anything with the word static in front of it happens before the program is compiled. So before the, as you're making the EXE, it's done before the exe is created. So if the exe gets created and the library is in there, then it's statically, statically linked. And static loading happens with statically linked. It's guaranteed. It's statically loaded means you're going to already place it. You're already going to configure the memory footprint ahead of time. All your allocation schemes and everything, your plan of a your plan of allocation is already done, so that when the program runs, it does the same thing every single time it runs. So languages like Java, as an example, are dynamically linked and dynamically loaded. Everything in the language is done dynamically, actually. It's done dynamically because it's more conservative with the memory footprint. uses up less memory, runs more streamlined, however, it takes longer to load. It takes longer to load because it has to go out and find, is that class loaded? No, okay, load it up. Is that class over there not loaded? No, okay, load it up. <coughs> or, yes, it is loaded. It's way over there. Oh, let me go find it. Okay, let me go map to it. All that configuration, all that work happens after you run the program. Versus C++, that's sta everything's static with that. Unless you're using um, new and delete, and you're using the heap memory location of the process. <coughs> but you're still statically allocating that as well. It's a statically compiled, statically linked, loaded and linked language for the most part. And what ends up happening with that is it just loads up immediately and runs immediately. But it takes up more memory because every single program is allocating its own object. Well, how many of these objects do we have in memory? Well, we might have five different of the same object in memory. And do we care about that? No, we just add more memory on the computer. <laughs> so Windows systems in general in the old days they required more RAM, actually. Actually, even today, you can't get a really fast-running Windows machine without about, what, 4 gigs, 6 gigs, 8 gigs of RAM? You can actually, this computer, actually, my MacBook Air only has 2 gigs on it, and it runs faster than my Windows machine does. <laughs> and it only has 2 gigs on it, because everything's dynamically allocated with that. So this, if you're going to statically allocate everything, you're going to need more RAM, because you're going to fill it up more, because you've got more stuff loaded. But it's faster in the load and the unload. It just, if you need it, load it up. But everybody's got the same copy. 
instead of having to share something. So the sharing does make things run a little bit slower in terms of the, pro but it's more conservative with the memory. So as you go through this material and you kind of think about these concepts, imagine these are trade-offs. These are operating system trade-offs. So if you're going to do dynamic loading and dynamic linking and you're going to make a bunch of shared libraries, then you got to figure out how you manage it. Well, Windows discovered, well, what if we just put a registry together? So the registry manages all the dynamically linked libraries, all your DLLs. And then we can also use it for other stuff. So the registry is kind of like an index to look up to see where is this stuff loaded? Is it loaded? If not, load it. When the computer starts back up again, load this, this, and this, and do that, configure it this way. That's like the brains of the operation, really, which is why nobody should edit that thing. But um, long story short, you had to come up with that scheme. As an operating system vendor, you had to discover, well, how am I going to do that? And you know, how am I, if I'm going to do it dynamically, so it can maybe be more conservative. Windows 8 is very dynamic. And you might notice that you can probably get a Windows 8 machine with half the amount of memory as a Windows 7. And it runs twice as fast because it's all dynamic. It's not taking up as much memory, much better footprint, total redesign in terms of that. So anyway, I heard they were coming out with another version of 8, though, to fix the UI. Not so hip on the GUI. So the UI is terrible, but the underlying underneath it is good. It just needs a better interface. So Apparently, though, there's, a, there's one in the makings, and it's going to be out probably... Well, Apple always releases their new releases around September, October, beginning. So I'm I'm pretty sure that's when the new version of Windows is coming out as well. <laughs> so they're gonna time it at the same time, and then they'll make it pre-holiday season so that people, you know, can buy it for the holiday season as well. There seems to be a cycle with this. So anyway, it's been going on for years. Anyway, so covered that last time and still reviewing. That was dynamically linked and dynamically loading. I also talked about swapping last time. That's when we fill up the memory completely and we have to take something out. Well, we're going to do some swapping. We're going to pull something out of memory and put it on what's called a backing store and save it because eventually we're going to need to use it again. So this works a lot with CPU scheduling. So remember CPU scheduling a few weeks ago where we have processes and they're in a process control block and they're waiting to run. They're loaded up into memory first. And then the memory address or where they're located is put in the process control block. And the CPU decides, well, what kind of scheduler am I going to use? A round robin, a first come, first serve, shortest job first. And you wrote a couple schedulers, or maybe you haven't done this yet, but you'll write a couple schedulers and you'll compare the schedulers. And then you'll realize, well, that's a lot of processes loaded up into memory. Am I not going to run out of memory? Yeah, you are going to run out of memory. So on the fifth or sixth or seventh, or depending on when you run out of memory, the process that's in memory is not going to be in memory anymore. It's going to be swapped out. It's going to be put on a backing store waiting to be swapped back in again unless the process is running. So we have a swapping routine that makes more efficient use of the memory so we can put in twice as many or four times as many items into memory. Not all going to fit, but we have the illusion that it's all in memory. So we swap it out and we tell, we update the PCB to say, hey, you know, you got swapped out. Oh. So you got swapped out because maybe you're a long job and you're waiting for I.O. and you haven't really run yet. So you get swapped out, and then the next time you come up for your CPU time, you get swapped back in because <laughs> you need to run. So it's going to pick a victim, something else, and swap it back out. A lot of the modern-day operating systems do an aging technique, and you can see this happening actually with Windows real easily. I've done it with 7, and I've done it with XP. haven't tried it on 8 yet. Load up about five windows in the morning, you know, run Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, or something, I don't know, whatever applications you have, run about five, six different applications. And then only use about two of them. <laughs> and then have them loaded since the morning, and then around after lunch, quickly go to one of them that you haven't used. And you'll see waiting, waiting, waiting. If you wait long enough, it might actually reload, but that program's been swapped out. Definitely been swapped out. It will come back. It's just waiting because you clicked on it too fast. Your graphics processor loaded the GUI, but the process scheduler hasn't decided where your memory is yet. It's trying to find it over on the swap drive. <laughs> Finds it on the swap drive. It will load it back up. It will recover, but people are too impatient. They'll go, waiting, waiting. 
it's not responsive. It's not responsive. Well, it's, it's not going to load. And then you close the program down, and then you load it back up again. But that's because your program got swapped out because you didn't use it. So it works on a least recently used algorithm where it picks a victim by the program you haven't used in a while. It'll take it out, although it's supposed to be loaded, and it's not loaded. So then people worry, and they go, well, you know, I've loaded up five programs, and uh, my computer is going to run slower if I load up five. Nope. It's going to run at the same speed because those five programs are not loaded. <laughs> However, it would run a lot faster if you closed it. <laughs> because the next time you open it up, it's faster just to go open it up than to go find it out there on a swap drive on a backing store and load it back up again. So the theory is, you know, open it when you need it. So on a Windows system, you constantly open it, you constantly close, and you constantly open it. And then, and then you switch to a Mac system, and then people get confused. When you load a program once, you loaded it forever. You don't. When you close it, it's still loaded. This is a different type of loading mechanism, different type of swapping. So that's the first thing people have a hard time getting used to is the fact that the programs don't close unless you close it. You can close it, but it takes longer to load it than it is just to leave it open, which is the exact opposite kind of work uh, user experience because the memory is done differently, so the swapping is done differently, and the footprint's done differently. So the memory is tiered. So you have the parts that you need up front, the other parts are being swapped. It still does a swapping technique, but the whole memory scheme is completely different. Whole user experience is different, completely different. So how do you know that? Well, as a user, your user experience is different. So a lot of the operating system design, again, is not only a trade-off pros and cons with features, but it's also at giving you the user experience that you're getting. So a lot of people like don't like that. You know, oh, it's how come I know? I can't close it. You don't have the control. So Windows people, I know, I understand. You guys like the control, and you guys like the feeling, and it seems easier. There's less stuff going on for you. On a, on a Mac system, you don't have as much control. It's going to work a certain way whether you like it or not. You just get, Once you get used to it, though, then you like it because then you, don't have, you can give up control. You don't necessarily need to be that much control over it. So. All right, so swapping. And the uh, process is temporarily moved out. So the process space is allocated to somebody else. Your process space from the one that was moved out is put on a backing store. And it's brought back into memory when it's needed, when the execution continues. Well, the process control block is going to store where it is on the backing store. The CPU scheduler is going to pull up that process and say, OK, it's time for you to run. First thing that's going to happen is you're going to have to load it back into memory. So the more memory you're using, the more programs you have opened up, the slower your CPU schedule is going to work too. Because the difference between going between the screens is going to be increased by the swapping time. So they all play together, they all work together. So the backing store is the name of the fast disk. Is it a fast disk? Well, it's formatted like the memory, but it's using secondary storage. So I don't know how fast that really is. It's not as fast as your main memory. So it's just enough to accommodate all the copies in the memory. We can roll in, roll out, which is the terminology used to bring something out of memory and then to put something back into memory. And the major part of the swap time is the transfer time. The total transfer time is directly proportional to the amount of memory being swapped. Uh, other minor little factors that play into that, but they don't aren't that significant is the speed of your memory. So sometimes if, you're, if your computer is doing a lot of swapping, the faster your memory, the mm, slightly better results, but not significant. Not significant to the point where it merits the, sp the expense of putting in faster memory, because your MMU is not going to necessarily recognize it. So if the MMU is configured correctly and the time is configured correctly, then the scheme is, is supposed to be configured to work with those parameters so that the swapping happens, you know, while the user is not aware of it going on. So, so modified uh, versions of swapping are found in many systems, Unix, Linux, Windows, everybody does swapping, but they're modified, they're de they don't all do the same technique. And the system maintains a ready queue to run, uh, ready to run processes which have uh, memory images on the disk. So you can actually do your queuing with your swapping <coughs> technique. So as an example, you've got a bunch of stuff out there, but you're not using it. 
Well, then the state of the process is going to be waiting or sleeping or something else. It's not going to be ready, which means that process is going to exit out of the CPU scheduler. <laughs> and it's going to be like a, a back burner process. It's just going to hang out there until you're going to use it, maybe. And maybe you're not going to ever use it again. And then we don't have to worry about it. CPU can just ignore it completely. There, it doesn't do busy waiting. Busy waiting is when it's, it goes and checks the process. Are you ready to run again? Because if you change, change the state of the process and it's not ready anymore because it's minimized or something, then uh, you don't waste CPU time checking to see if you should run anything on it. Which is different, actually, because if you close down your mail program on a Mac computer, it's still in the background running. It hasn't ended but and you'll still get free and free you'll still get new email messages coming in <laughs> and then you open it back up again you go oh look I got all these new email messages that came in or sometimes you can set notifications to actually say hey I got a new email came in well was it the ready state was that process in a ready state probably so you can play around with the different states of processes depending upon the nature of the application if it's a word program chances are it's not going to change very much while it's sleeping <laughs> email program web browser, stuff like that, same thing with internet connectivity, is probably going to change its state a little bit differently. So depending upon the user's experience, you can change um, the states around as well. So here's an extraction here, and I, I basically covered this part as well. We're going to get where I left off soon. Where you swap a process out, and then you swap a process back in. Again, it's in the user space of the process. That is, and I like to do this upside down, actually. It's in the higher banks of the memory. But if you start with zero and go this way, I like to start with zero on the bottom and grow up. But uh, anyway, it's going to be in the higher memory areas of the, of the process space. So what we're looking at in terms of memory allocation schemes is how are we going to allocate this? We have a starting place after the operating system is already loaded. We say, OK, now we have one gig left for the user programs. Because you know that eight gigs isn't being used, or your four gigs is not being used solely for you. It's being used for the operating system as well. You're getting a portion of it that's left over. So here's our portion. How are we going to allocate it? Well, we have some allocation schemes. So originally, we came out with this contiguous allocation scheme. So the main memory was partitioned into two parts. We have the operating system that's on the lower parts. And then we have the user processes that are held in the higher memory. That's what I was saying before. This is the lower banks. This is the higher banks. Why? Because if we're doing a continuous scheme, we're going to locate things starting with zero, and we're going to the end. So if we have 1,000 banks, we're going zero to 1,000, each one of these banks looking for something as a search. Our allocation scheme determines our search scheme. <laughs> Where are we going to find something? But with the process control block, we keep track of the memory location where we put the process so we don't have to search for it. So we have other routines and the other data structures to keep track of memory addresses, where we put a DLL, that would be the registry, uh, where we put a process, that would be the PCB, where we stick something for the operating system, will that be in here, the pre-configured area. And so we can minimize our search space by coming up with these other little routines that are part of the other data structures and things. So relocation registers are used to protect the user's processes from each other. So if the process was loaded here and we have the starting memory address, then we know from the relocation scheme how much memory it gets. It's just like saying, oh, you get 5. OK, so that address times 5, we're not going to touch it. So it gets protected. So this belongs to the process. Nobody else can use it unless another process comes in and swaps you out of memory, reuses your space, essentially. Uh, but let's talk about no swapping at this point. Um, so the relocation register is used, and it's going to protect this space that's been allocated to a process. And the schemes are kind of um, they're kind of convoluted, but you're talking about a base address that contains a small physical address, and then you have a limit. Well, uh, how big are you going to make it? And then the MMU maps the maps the address dynamically. So I looked at this before, and this is a hardware address protection with base scheme and limited registers. You can put it in the hardware. And the hardware can keep track of how big each one of the allocated units are going to be. But what we're looking at is allocating memory 
assigning it an address and stamping a label on it. It says process one, process two, process three. So if we do it at a hardware level, we have a faster lookup. We have a faster addressing scheme and translation. If we do it from a software perspective, then we have to run an algorithm. So if we have the hardware that we know we're going to have when we allocate the memory, um, such as, uh, you know, so long story short, a Apple operating system that works on their own hardware, they're making their own hardware, so they can use a hardware addressing mechanism. So they can put the control down at a hardware level, make it run faster. If you're a Windows operating system, you can't do that because you don't know what hardware you're going to be installed on. And why are you going to stick that on the hardware? You're not, you're a vendor, last thing in the world you're going to do is go out and query all the different operating systems. Well, there's only one really that you're going to write it for, which is going to be Windows. <laughs> you could be writing it for Linux or Mac, or, or eh, not writing it for Mac. Uh, but long story short, you're not going to have the information you need to even implement it anyway, nor are you going to spend the extra money on it. So you're going to put out the cheapest combination of, of parts and pieces that you possibly could. It's not, going to reach, it's not going to have any of the hardware support for protection of the memory. Uh, so this scheme is going to be different depending upon the operating system. So here's the allocation. So we have multiple different parts that are segmented out, given a base address and the limit. So we know how big these spaces are. So the addressing is giving us our space size. We fill up the spaces and in a continuous allocation scheme. We fill it up one after the other. So, and this was, this, you can do this actually. Let's say you're a microwave oven, you're going to use contiguous allocation. Why? Because, well, you're going to make sure you have enough memory to load up all the functions that are possible so everything fits. And then you're going to set the sizes the same size so it doesn't really matter what order you stick something in. So if you press that number button, it's going to put one, two, three. It's going to fill everything up, and then you're going to start, <laughs> and then it all comes down at the end. So it's a pretty easy memory mapping. So contiguous allocation works. Works for batch processing. Works for machine uh, instructions and things that are being sent for mechanical devices and for uh, microwave ovens. A watch can be allocated uh, contiguously. So it does have its place and purpose. Does it work in all operating systems? Nope, and here's why. So you have a hole with, with contiguous memory allocation, you have what's called internal fragmentation. Excuse me, external fragmentation. You don't have any internal, you just have external. And if you're using the same size blocks, then you're going to have internal fragmentation. External fragmentation happens when you have a hole of memory and you have one here, and you have one here, and you have one here. You have the memory, but it's not continuously allocated. So you can't put the process in there. It won't fit. You have all these holes, and you count up all the holes, and you have enough memory with all the holes. But you can't do it because they're not all next to each other. Internal fragmentation happens when you set the hole size the same for everybody. We have a big one, and then we have a little one. The little one's got internal fragmentation because there's memory in there the little guy's not using, but it's allocated to the little guy, and he's not going to let it go. Nobody else can see it. It's protected. So long story short, you can't use the memory. So fragmentation creates memory you can't use, bottom line. In multiple partition allocation, in this particular case, we have these holes, and the holes are the available memory. So a hole is a block of available memory and the holes of various different sizes are scattered throughout the memory. So when a process arrives, it is allocated from memory from a hole that's large enough to accommodate it. So we have different allocation schemes associated with continuous. Operating system maintains information about the allocated partitions, the free partitions, or the holes, and that might be available so it can allocate another one. So this is called dynamic storage allocation problem. Because we don't know if we could figure if we could figure this out ahead of time, like a microwave oven, all the different routines, then which is the kind of the key right there. If you can predict all of the different patterns and all the different possible combinations, you can configure the scheme to make better use of it and do it contiguously. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly what we're going to be clicking on in the user interface, especially if we go with a you know, an operating system for a personal computer, we don't know what programs. And we're, we have all these programs we're going to run. So we have to do it dynamically instead of statically. So if we do it dynamically, we have a problem. How are we going to pick next hole? 
So how to satisfy the request of size n from a list of free holes. Well, we can do is first fit, best fit, or worst fit. So first fit just takes the first hole and allocates it. So it makes a fast, fast, um, very fast hole finding technique. So it allocates the first hole that is big enough. Not bad, except for the second, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth one that come through. You're going to end up getting starved eventually if you don't have any holes left. Um, and maybe you're not, you know, you were the first one that just found the first one. So maybe it's not keeping track of how many other holes there are and not using things correctly. The best fit allocates the smallest hole that is big enough, but the search it has to search the entire list to find it unless, the, unless it's ordered by size. So unless you've ordered the list, by this, the free hole list, by the size of the how big they are, and put the smallest ones first and the bigger ones second. You got to search the whole list to find the best fit. Produces the smallest leftover hole. <laughs> so, or the worst fit. Allocate the largest hole. Let's also search the entire list as well. And produces the largest leftover hole that might be there. So if you're worried about being able to fit, you're going to do the worst fit and then you're going to have internal fragmentation with that. The best fit is probably the best way of doing it, but you have to order the list. If you don't order the list, then you're going to have to, you know, search the whole list to find it. So this is um, can be easily put into a real-world example by a sushi bar. You guys ever go to the sushi bars, you know, and they have the, the boats that go around in a circle? And then they have chairs that sit around the table. So two people walk into it. This is, that sounds like a joke. But two people walk into a sushi bar, <laughs> and they want to sit together. And you look around and you see a hole that four chairs in the hole, and you see one that has two, and you see one that has one. If you use a first fit, the couple's going to sit in the four, but right behind them is a party of four. You can't accommodate them at all. They have to wait because you just took the four that could accommodate them and you made it into the two. So if you go down to the best fit, so that's the first fit, you take the couple and you put them into the four seating, four contiguous seats together instead of putting them into the two. So if you do the best fit on that, you gotta go, well, okay, wait a minute, we got four here, and this is what the waitress does, you got four here, wait a minute, there's two over there, you got one over there, she's gonna do the best fit. If she's smart, she's gonna stick you in the two. Because the four, the party of four is going to starve. They're not going to be able to sit down. If you do the worst fit, you're also going to do the, the two that are going to be in the four seat as well. This is the first. It happened to have been the first one you found. Let's so let's say you just start looking and go. Oh, here's a one. Here's a two. Here's a four. Up, oh, put them in the four. You got to search the whole list to find the worst one possible. Why do you want to do that? Well, maybe because you don't know. If you're going to get someone behind you, the party you don't know about the party before behind you, and you want to satisfy the customer, you want to make the customer get seated as fast as possible. See, so oh, here's this one. How's this one? They're going to like the. If I were a couple coming in there, I'd like the four better than the two because you got more room around you. You can spread out a little bit. It's a better fit for the two, but it's the, it's the worst fit for the entire algorithm. So that's what the operating system is doing to the processes that are coming up. And the two, the four, the six, whatever, how many spaces you need is how big is that process? <laughs> or how big is the party? How big is your sushi bar party that's coming through? So the first fit and the worst fit are better, excuse me, the first fit and the best fit are better than the worst fit in terms of speed and storage allocation. The worst fit, you got to search the whole list to find the worst possible combination. Why do you want to do that? Because you're guaranteed it's going to fit you're going to try and make it work. So you don't have to actually calculate the size of each one of the holes. You just go visually look around and go, oh, there's, there's a space over there. And then you walk over there and you say, oh, there's four seats. Oh, we only need two. No problem. That's the worst fit. But on the best fit, that's when, I hate it when restaurants do this, actually, because they can't do it in real time. So they do a static approach to this. They wait a few minutes. You have to, like, stand behind a line. Instead of like seating you when you show up, and then they go, okay, what do we got? We got party two, party four, party, okay, we got one. And then they take you as a group, and they allocate you. <laughs> when they're trying to do a best fit, but they're queuing you up ahead of time. 
Most restaurants queue you up ahead of time. That's where you, it's like you look in the restaurant and there's tons of tables open, but you're still waiting. <laughs> then you're doing a best fit in a queue because they're trying to make sure that they can maximize at the expense of the customer because they're waiting. You don't want to make a customer wait, but they're trying to maximize the best fit possibilities. So they're queuing you up is what they're doing. So most restaurants will only queue you maybe two parties, three parties together. You know, They just won't seat you immediately because they're afraid about doing this first fit. They, they don't want to do that. It's because they haven't trained their um, seaters on the correct algorithm approach, and they can't do it in real time dynamically. Instead, they have to think too much. So. And it might be also on scheduling rules because you know, in, in a restaurant, unlike an operating system, <laughs> In a restaurant, you have people going on shift, not on shift, and then you have an operating system. You have one CPU that's working, that's scheduling everybody. In a restaurant, you got five waiters, waitresses, that are serving different groups of processes. So one of them might have a lot of, a lot of processes assigned to it, and another one might not be, might not have anything assigned to them. So then they have to figure out that dynamic and they have to go. Well, which one are we going to put them into? That's why they queue you up, and they go, "Oh, we want you to put you in that group over there, or that group over there, or that group over there," because they're trying to balance, trying to load balance the waiters, so the wait staff. Okay, so next time you go to a sushi bar, just take a look around at all the spaces available and pick the worst fit, <laughs> because then that will minimize the amount of customers will be able to sit in the sushi bar. <laughs> I understand they have sushi trains too. There's boats and trains around here, so. Yes, I'm definitely a fan of the sushi. So you, you can't be a vegetarian. Actually, no, some vegetarians eat sushi, though. It's fish. It's not It's not um, beef or pork or something like that. Anyway, fragmentation. As I mentioned before, um, we have the internal and we have the external fragmentation that exists. We can actually get fragmentation on the uh, the sushi bars. Oh, okay, wait a minute. We have a, we have a guide to doing attendance here. So let me, let me take a break. This is a good pause time. If I talk about sushi, I get everybody's attention again. <laughs> so yeah, there's internal and external fragmentation on the sushi boat. So you know the boats, they don't carry just one plate of sushi. They carry multiple plates of sushi. So if, for example, and you have multiple boats. So if you have um, em no empty boats, and all of the boats have only one plate on it, you don't have any external, but you have a lot of internal fragmentation. If you have a big dish that takes up just one boat, where the other boats normally take up two, two dishes or two plates, but you have a big one and you need a boat that has two spaces available, not just one, it may never have that. That would be internal fragmentation because all of the boats are used, all the boats are being used, but you can't switch one boat and put two plates, take one plate off of one boat take, and put it onto another boat so you can have an empty boat. That's swapping, by the way, in an operating system world. Uh, but you have that problem because you need to take up two spaces. There are two spaces, but they're not on one boat constantly. They're on multiple boats. So, Or you have the case in which you have external fragmentation where you require two boats, but you only and you have two boats, but one boat's over here and the other boat's over here, and you needed the boats tied together, together as a group. So you needed two simultaneous boats. So you do have you do have external and internal fragmentation at the sushi bar as well. So as well as allocation problems. So technically, in operating systems terms, external fragmentation. External fragmentation is the total memory space exists to satisfy the request, but it is not continuous. It's all over the place. So you uh, don't have, if we could keep the volume, okay, now I have way too much talking. If we could keep, I'll just stop talking. Okay, very good. It's distracting to me. I can't, I can't even keep a thought pattern going <laughs> because I'm worried about too many other conversations that are going on in the room. All right, external fragmentation is when a space exists but it's not contiguous. Internal fragmentation is allocated memory. You gave a process some memory, but it's, the, the process, the space is slightly larger than what the process needs. If the space is smaller than what the process needs, you can't allocate it. It doesn't work. You can't put half a process in a space, and you can't fit the process into multiple spaces, so you can't split it up. 
So internal fragmentation is when you've got extra unused space inside of the process. Um, when do you get internal fragmentation? When you set a, some artificial size of the space and you have processes of different sizes. So operating systems have gone around this one for the most part because now they're going to set all process space the same size and all the spaces to be allocated in memory the same size which means the process itself is going to get it whether you want it or not and they don't care about internal process. They don't care about internal fragmentation. However, internal fragmentation reduces the amount of memory you have on your system because you're taking your memory, allocating it as if you're going to be using it, but maybe the process isn't going to use it. Although you're given a certain allotment, you're going to have excess, excess minutes at the end of the month. It's kind of like how when they give, they used to give minutes, now everybody has unlimited cell phone service. But in the past, you used to be allocated minutes, like 200 minutes or something, and then at the end of the month, you'd have some leftover. That's really internal fragmentation because you had extra minutes that you didn't use, and then some plans had they, you know, roll it over, carry it over to the next month, or sometimes you just lost those minutes, which was the case. So in an operating system, the allocation is very similar to that concept. And that's what's meant by internal fragmentation. You can reduce external fragmentation by compaction. So that means you're going to compact or defrag. So you defrag a hard drive to get rid of external fragmentation. And <clears throat> what does that mean? You have so much hard drive space available and it's not contiguous, but you need it contiguous. Well, actually, the secondary storage management techniques that they have now for the allocation don't look for contiguous memory. So right now, nobody uses contiguous memory for anything unless unless you're a batch operating system. Um, but long story short, the same concept exists for memory. You can compact the memory, move the blocks around, move the data around a little bit. It's like going to the sushi boat and taking all the pieces and filling up as many boats as you can to fill all the boats so you have empty boats left over. That's compact compaction. So you can shuffle the memory contents around so you have larger free, free memory to gather in one block. So it's possible only if there's a relocation, and the relocation is dynamic. If it's statically allocated and the relocation is statically configured, you can't move anything once it started executing. But if you have dynamic relocation routine going on, then you can do it dynamically. What does that mean? Well, your, your offset with your base address, that's your relocation register that you're keeping. So if you're doing that dynamically and you're allocating things with the reg, you know, you're picking a register number and you're picking the offset for it, and you're doing that dynamically, then certainly you can move things around. <clears throat> we also have an I/O problem, where we have um, let's we put the job in the memory while it is being involved in I/O, and we start moving it. That's going to be a problem. So you do I you do I/O only into OS buffers and not into the memory. So you can create buffered memory for I/O. Because you can't, you might end up with a situation where the I.O. is not going to complete because the memory is not available and you can't move it once it's in memory. So it brings up a different scenario in terms of um, the I.O. situation. So this is a strict contiguous memory allocation scheme where we are just looking at the memory in terms of blocks and we're looking at holes in memory and we're going to put something in an empty hole, an empty spot. Well, <clears throat> paging came around to get past a contiguous situation. So you're not working, you're not going to do a paging scheme unless you're going to be working in a multi-processing, multi-user interactive mode because it doesn't make sense. So paging takes the logical address space of the process, makes it non-contiguous, picks out a bunch of empty spaces anywhere you want on, in the system and allocates them to a page. So divides out the physical memory and the division of the physical memory are called frames. You put the frames inside of pages and then the frames can be located anywhere you want. So now you're going to take up all of the empty spaces and see how many you have, put them in a, put them in a page and then each process needs a certain number of pages and you allocate it by page. Then you can allocate all that process. So you make that smaller abstract abstraction into a bigger one. So you take the little pieces, you put them all together. Oh wait, we have enough right here. Oh, look, we have enough right here. So I think of this sort of like how people go through a change drawer. <laughs> so you want to go out and you buy, want to buy coffee, but you don't have any paper money on you, so you're going to go through the change drawer. Or you're going to go look through the couch or wherever, you're, wherever you put your coins these days. 
Um, Americans leave them in the couch because they fall out of people's pockets. And then you, you know, um, I, you know what? I'm out of money right now. I, I just, I don't have some change around here somewhere. I need two bucks, right? So you go to the couch and you find, oh, look, there's four quarters on the couch. Uh, that's a dollar. Perfect. And then you go say, okay, okay, I exhausted the couch. And let me go try the chair over there. And there's, there's 50 cents in dimes on the chair, you know, and, and you're putting all this stuff together. And eventually you get two bucks. Takes you a little longer, doesn't it? To go say, let me just go to the ATM and pull out $20. <laughs> and I have more than $2. Yeah, if we had unlimited resources of memory, that would work. But <clears throat> so the paging scheme, there's time to put together to go find the quarters and find the dimes and the nickels and the pennies. Worst case scenario, you can always go to the, your car. I always find money in my car. There's coins everywhere usually. So, <laughs> But that's going to take longer. So you're going to prioritize, you know, you're going to easily create the pages ahead of time by the resources that you're going to find and then you're going to allocate them so you can come up with the two dollars or come up with the available memory that you're going to need. So this scheme takes time, long story short. Um, is the time worth it? Possibly. Can you get hardware support for it? Yep. Can you make it faster? Yep. Can you just allocate everything right from the get-go this way? Yep. And if you do that, then it doesn't take as much time. So if I already know, this is, this is like saying, well, if I already know I'm going to have quarters in the couch, I'll just put a little bucket next to the couch. Here, when you, when you, when you lose your quarter, put them in the bucket. <laughs> so I just pick up the buckets now. So these are going to be tables, page tables. They're going to tell us which is available. We're going to keep track of the free frames. We're going to keep track of the free pages. We're going to keep track of what's been allocated, what hasn't been allocated. So we put buckets out, or tip jars out, or something out, and so people put the money in the jar. Or people put the money. Yeah, actually, people do that in their own homes. You have change. Actually, I have a change container, and then it just fills up. I never empty the thing out until it gets too big, and then ah, uh, and then I got to take it to the bank. They don't take them anymore. You have to roll them up now if you have all that change. So it's better to spend the change ahead of time. But that's what the change bucket's about. You know, the change jar. So anyway, long story short, you're going to keep track of all of the free frames Well, you're going to get a bucket for it <laughs> or a list, free frame list or something. So the logical space of the process is non-contiguous. The process is allocated physical memory whenever the later is available. Whenever you have any memory available, you're going to allocate it. You divide it out into frames. You make the frames some size that's associated with your algorithm that's going to be for your allocation. You divide the logical memory out into blocks. And the same size can be called a page. So frames go into pages, and so many pages are going to be allocated to process. You keep track of the free frames or the pages, depending upon how you're going to do it. And to run the program of size n pages, you need to find n free frames and then load the program. So this is better than uh, looking in the couch and in the chair and everything. You just go to the change bucket. I need change. Go to the change bucket. Pull some resources out of that, and then you got it. So you set up the page table to translate the logical and the physical addresses. Page table is your bucket. <laughs> it's in the bucket. You see, oh, look, there's a quarter. Oh, look, there's a dime. And you find all the pieces. Well, you go to your page table, you find all of the free frames that you got and what's available, what's not available, and you allocate. You keep the page table keeps track of who's got what. What are you going to get? In this particular case, you might get some internal fragmentation because this is a fixed size again. So you're making pages of certain sizes and you're making frames of certain sizes, numbers of pages. How do you know you're going to need exactly that? It's kind of like when you go and you give two dollars and then they give you that change to begin with. That's what causes. Well, that's internal fragmentation because it didn't cost two dollars, but I needed two dollars in order to do it. But now I have change. Well, great. What do I do with the change? Throw it in the bucket. <laughs> That's your internal fragmentation from your monetary system <laughs> for the most part, uh, but you're making use of the internal fragmentation, hopefully. There's, you know, there's a lot of people, Americans do this, so they show, throw the change out the window, or they drop the change on the ground, or they just leave it on the table, or they just get rid of it. They don't want the internal fragmentation, but then, you know, the change adds up over time. So. I'm not afraid, you know, people, actually it's happening, they used to have it with pennies, you just throw the penny away. You know, it does, it's, people used to throw them away in the garbage, but you can just leave it. We don't want the pennies. I don't want the penny, right? And then people used to find pennies on the Now you're finding nickels and dimes on the ground. <laughs> I can tell you, as I walk down the street and I go, oh, look, there's a nickel, there's a dime. People are just going to leave it. <coughs> Unless it's a quarter, I'll pick up a quarter. But, <laughs> <laughs> but 
But people don't care about that internal fragmentation. But it adds up, actually. But how many pennies are going to really not going to add up too much? Unless you're deciding you're going to go to Las Vegas or Reno and you're going to play the penny machine, then you're going to want the pennies. But and they have these to have penny machines. It's like why pay? Why why play a penny machine? <laughs> well, you know you put twenty five pennies into the machine because <laughs> one penny just doesn't give you enough. So, all right, address translation scheme. So in order to do the pages, you have to figure out how you're going to address them to create this abstraction of the page. So the address is generated by the CPU is divided into two components, very similar to an offset. Well, excuse me, very similar to a translation, memory translation. So we have a page number, and then we have the offset for how big we're going to make the pages. So the page number is used as, a, used as an index in the page table which contains the base address of the page in the physical memory. So it's an address. And then we have the size of the address. How many addresses are we going to put in there? That's the offset. So instead of saying from this number to that number, we're just saying from this number plus 5, or this number plus 10, which is our offset. So it's a combination of the base address to define the physical address that is set to the memory unit. So it's the page offset, or distance number. So if we have paging hardware, we can actually do a little bit faster, kind of like translation hardware for memory lookup for logical to physical address. So we have the logical address, and then we have the physical address, and then we have the offset that's made. And then when the page table is going to keep track of that for us. So we can take our logical, we can figure out what our physical is from it by looking up into the page table. And then we can allocate non-contiguous memory this way. And we can pretty much put a bunch of pieces together and call it something and make it big enough. So what we end up happening now is an algorithm that's very similar to what we get with files actually. One file could be stored on your secondary memory storage in about dozens of different places allocated all over the place because it's going to use a similar, it's using a file concept and the file is made up of a bunch of pointers to memory location. Well, it doesn't all have to be in the same location. We just keep track of all the different locations. It's called a file allocation table. So our FAT table stored on the hard drive keeps track of where our files are stored. It's just an index, very similar to a page table that keeps track of where the memory, where the processes are in memory. So here's a paging model of the logical and the physical memory. So we have the logical memory out here. We have page 0, 1, 2, 3. Our page table with our frame numbers. So frame number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are our physical memory. So over here we have page 0, page 0. We have page 1 is in number 4. So page 0 is in number 1. So we go to number 1, we have page 0. Page 1 is in number 4. So you can kind of sort of see how the translation works. So it just keeps track of um, which frames we're using for which pages. Frames are inside of pages. Pages are allocated to the process. If you want to remember it, actually, frames sounds more physical, doesn't it? <laughs> so frames are physical abstraction. A page is more of a software level abstraction, so that's a logical abstraction. Much more logical. So. So here's our paging example, another one. So our logical memory, and this is just a single, single frame for a single page. This is kind of an easier approach. So it's a one-to-one -one mapping. So here we'll have one that has multiples. So we have, oh, number zero is in number five. So it has five, excuse me. So number zero we have, um, how is this working? Logical memory to the physical memory. A, B, C, D, and E is over here on 20. Uh, e, F, G, and H. Oh, let's see, 5. E, F, G, and H is over here. Where, where is E, F, G, and H? I, J, K, and L is here, which is 4 from, not, from 8 from over here. How's this mapping working? Um, two, six, six. 
I don't know. There's a mapping that's going on between the two of them here. The mapping is basically saying from the logical perspective, which ones of these are going to be in the physical banks from the, fra from the frame. So. The examples that are in this textbook are actually slightly confusing in my opinion. So if you get this one, you get the concept actually. So. Six, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. They're all the same size. One, two, three, four. So it's a four, four location character. Five, zero, five. F. Hmm. Zero, one, two, three. Zero, four, five. Anyway. Long story short, here's a better one here. Actually, this is a free frame list. So, oh, it's a 32 bit memory and a 4 bit byte page. So, the translation is going from 4 bytes over. Probably better to read the explanation that's in the textbook for this. This, came, this actually comes right out of the textbook. So, it's a bit of a convoluted example, in my opinion. So, we can also keep track of free frames. So, if we're going to keep track of the page table, keeps track of which frames are allocated by which pages. So which frames, this is supposed to be keep tracking, keeping track of which physical frame is allocated to which logical frame that we have specified. So the free frame is going to keep track of what's not allocated, it's the exact opposite. So we have what's called a free frame list. So instead of a lookup table, and the lookup table is going to provide us with a, well, it's supposed to provide us with a mechanism to figure out which one goes with which one. The Free frame list is simply a list, and the list is going to give us um, our available memory pool. So here we have a free frame list of the ones that are, oh, geez, the other ones that are empty. 14, 13, 18. Okay, good. This one's clear. So we have the darker spaces are the empty spaces. And then this free frame list over here, a new process, process, uh, process, uh, page table for the process is giving us our page one, page zero. So it's not necessarily in the order that it's available. Not necessarily, the free frames are not necessarily in the order, neither is the page table actually, in the order that we appear in physical memory. They're just showing up in terms of which blocks are available or which frames are available. So this is before the allocation, and this is after the allocation of a new process that comes in. And the new process is going to take up this one, so we have some that are left. So the new process is going to take up from the, from the ones that are available from the free frame list. It took up all of them but number 15. So, And it didn't allocate 15, but 15 was 15 in this list. Yeah, 15 was in this list, but it took all the other ones. So It only needed four of the five. And this is the page table. We can actually keep a page table per queue. We can keep a multiple page tables, and we can have a hierarchy of page tables as well, not to confuse you even further. But uh, page table, in terms of the implementation of the page table, so it's kept in memory as well. So the more page tables we keep, and the more information we put in the page table, in the operating system perspective, is going to end up in the kernel memory location. But it takes up memory and makes the kernel footprint bigger. So we're keeping, we're making more memory to keep track of memory. So we're, we're using our available resources by using our available resources, which is kind of um, counterintuitive, but it works because we're able to actually make better use of our available resources. It's kind of like paying an accountant to do your taxes to save you money. You pay the accountant, but you save money on your taxes, which is pretty much what's happening here. So page table registers point to the page tables, and then we have the page table length registers indicating the size of the page table. So in this game, every data or every instruction access requires two memory addresses, one for the page table and one for the data instruction. So it does take up memory. So the two memory process problem can be solved by the use of the special fast lookup hardware cache called an associated memory or associated look aside buffer. So instead of putting it up into memory and using resources, we're going to use hardware to support it instead. So this is like not hiring the accountant, but instead going and taking an accounting class. <laughs> so you know how to do it yourself. 
or implementing hardware if you're an operating system to do it for you because you don't want to use your memory to do it. So you have this thing called a look-aside buffer that will actually do the association for you to keep track of the pages that are allocated for the frames. And some uh, transaction look-aside buffers store address space identifiers, um, and then they, they're going to be stored in memory if that's the case. And then we have these are the unique identifiers for each process. Provides address space protection for that process. So here's an associative memory kind of scheme where we have a, a frame number and a page number that's associated. So and then we know the offset, just like a page table actually. It's a very similar concept. Where we start, we identify this is page number one, this is page number two, this is page number three. And page number one contains little, all the pages are going to have the same number of frames, five frames maybe. And then we're going to use this address. Well, this address is going to be the starting address, and we're going to count five. And then the next one's going to use five, the first address plus five, if that's the case, or another starting address plus five. So if P is associated register, and we get the number out on from a from a page, we get if we look at well, if we look at the associative memory, kind of like a dictionary, we can look it up and say, well, this page is at this frame, this frame, and this frame. So paging hardware does it for us so with a uh, look aside buffer, and the look aside buffers are going to give us our translation for us. So very similar to um, hardware implemented for page tables. So, which is a one of the alternatives to make the run to make it run faster. So CPU goes, looks it up, looks for the translate uh, the look aside buffer to see if this if it's a miss, if it's a hit, if it's already in memory, we can just use it. If it's not in memory, we gotta figure out well what page from the page table, where is it in memory, and then load it. So these page tables <coughs> and uh, whether it be a hardware, whether it be software, we find out which page it's in. We still gotta load it if it's not loaded. So we can call it what's called a hit and a miss ratio. So if we have a lot, we want to increase the number of hits, reduce the number of misses. If we reduce the number of misses, well, the miss means it's not a miss like an error. It means we have to go over to the swap file, load it back into memory. So because what we're going to do is go back to the concept of, well, we can fill up the memory. If we fill up the memory, we're going to swap something out. So if you take this concept, this overall concept, and combine it with memory management for swapping, then we can find out, okay, this one is supposed to be in here and it's supposed to be here. Is it loaded? If it's loaded, we don't have to do anything. If it's not loaded, then we have to go load it up, which causes a dynamic memory loading, long story short. So the effective access time is associated with the time it takes for the lookup to occur on the associated lookup. So it's assumption that, assume that we have a memory cycle and the time is one millisecond. We have a hit ratio. And that's the percentage of time that a page number is found in the associated register. We actually know which page it's in. And the ratio related to the number of associated registers. So the hit ratio is going to be equal to something. Well, then we have the effective access time. Long story short, it's a calculation to figure out. The slide's not showing us all of the symbols here. But it's a calculation that is, and I'm not going to ask anything about algorithms or calculations on the final exam. However, the time it takes us to go find the page and load the page up into memory, if we have it, and so because we have to go look it up. So long story short, we're implementing time, very similar to context switching actually, but it's the seek time because we have to go find it. If it were already loaded up into memory, we didn't have to worry about it. We weren't keeping track of what was loaded, what wasn't loaded, what was free, and what was taken. We wouldn't have to actually be concerned at all with this. So going back to contiguous contiguous memory allocation. Saves us all the time and energy. We don't have to do any of this. Non-contiguous memory allocation, we have to worry about how much time is it going to take us to manage the memory, and is it worth it? Otherwise, are we just going to have to run out of memory? Or are we going to limit the memory usage and not allow processes to use a lot of memory? Very similar to context switching. You can make a computer run very slow by increasing the amount of context switching. And then that kind of defeats the purpose. But you can run a 1,000 programs all at the same time. <laughs> but None of them run very quickly. So anyway, so the effective access time is one of the is one of the criteria that's used to measure the efficiency of the memory allocation scheme that tells us how much time it actually took to find the item um, and then load it up in well, not necessarily the load time, but the time it took us to go search to find the piece of memory that we we're looking at. 
So memory protection can also be implemented in here as well. We can say whether the, a, a bit is valid or invalid. So we can keep this information in the page tables to keep track of whether or not something's actually being used or something not being used. And that can reduce the amount of time it takes to access the, the particular piece of memory that we're interested in finding. So if we loaded something up into memory, it could be valid, and it belongs to that process. We have to swap it out. Well, when we change the bit to invalid, we just look in the table and we go, oh, it's valid. We don't have to worry about finding anything and associating anything. Going through any other checks, we just go, oh, it's valid. So it, makes us the fast, it makes the system run fast runs faster because it reduces the amount of search we have to do. It's like someone leaving a little note behind. It's locked. It's not locked. We don't have to check it. <laughs> so um, in terms of memory protection, that's implemented by associating a protection bit for each one of the frames. This says whether or not what's loaded in here actually matches what's loaded in the physical memory. So valid invalid is a bit attached to each one of the page tables. So valid means it indicates that the associated page is in the process's logical address space, and it's a legal page. Invalid indicates that the page is not in the process logical address space, and we have to go find it and load it back up, because it's going to give us a page fault. So valid and invalid bits are stored in the page table. And in the page table, we can figure this page number is valid, this one's valid. Oh, down here on the bottom, this one's invalid. <coughs> it's invalid because What's loaded up in the memory doesn't belong to the process that's using it. It got swapped out. The memory got reused for something else. And now it's not valid in this particular context for how it's being used. The invalid just means we got to go swap it back in. So We could have shared pages where multiple process processes can all use the same piece of memory. So we have shared code, so only one copy uh, one copy of read-only, which is basically called re-entrant code, is shared among multiple different processes, so text editors, compilers, Windows systems. So the shared code must appear in the same location in the logical address space of all processes. So basically we just open it up to make the memory location available to multiple processes, and then all of a sudden now we can have shared pages, which is how we're going to do a DLL, actually. So we load a DLL up into a memory location, we make the memory location available and accessible to all processes. We map the process memory to that available shared space. Voila, now we have the linking that goes on between the shared memory and the current process. And it becomes part of the process's usable space in terms of where it's loading. So if we can link it this way and share the pages, we don't have to load it up again. So we load it up once, we share it, and we use the page tables to make sure that we can make it available. So we mark it as being available. Other processes can go out and look at it and use it. We don't have to create our own copy of it. So we're using less memory because we're sharing existing code. So we have private code and data that exists for each one of our processes that we're going to keep private. So if you normally you see it, you have the process space broken out into three sections. You have the stack, the heap, and then on the bottom it says, um, oh, something about data or code down there on the bottom. Well, that's temporary data being held for integer i and static, static data, long story short. So each process keeps track of a copy of the code that it's running and the data. So when you double click on the file to run it, all the statements in that binary statements, or you know, the machine code actually, um, is kept. So it doesn't have to go back out to the disk. That's the code. It's the code of the program that you're running. It's the contents of that .exe file take it and put it into memory, then we no longer have to go back to the hard disk. We only go to the hard disk once. And then all the data that's being kept by the stack that's running, the program instructions, that's being held in the same area. So, so the pages of the private code and the data can appear anywhere in the logical address space. Normally it starts at the bottom because it's easier to find it. The entire processing in the runtime environment are looking at the code instructions the, those machines and machine instructions that's running. So if you're going to constantly be using that, the execution and the runtime, you're going to put it in a you know easy accessible area. But runtime environments don't have to put it at the beginning. They can put it anywhere they want inside of the address space. So here's our shared page example, uh, going back to that concept of multiple processes using the same page. 
We have process 1 on the top, and we have process 2 on the bottom. And in this particular configuration, we have a page table that's created for both processes. As I was mentioning before, and here's actually, there's three processes in here, believe it or not. There's process 2, process 1, and process 3. And then we have process 2, and the process 2 is the shared memory, and it's being used by both 1 and 2. So we have different memory that's allocated for both processes. It actually becomes part of the process space, but it's the same page, it's the same piece of memory that is owned by another process. So as long as it's marked as shareable or um, open, or however it's going to be indicated, then multiple processes can map to it and use it inside of their address space as if they were the part of their, their address space, long story short. So this is a good stopping point because next time I can talk about the structure of the page table, which is a completely different concept. Uh, but what I gave you today was kind of a review as well of the memory management scheme for main memory and the concept of shared pages. Not going to have anything more with this. This is pretty much, as I say, it's probably better to also read the chapter if you're trying to get a better background of this. What I'm giving you is a high level overview of all of these concepts. Shared pages, um, a good understanding of that would help you actually in creating DLL source code for DLLs and for shared objects and for using them for dynamic memory allocation and stuff. So. Uh, but that's all for today. Next time somebody remind me, we're going to start with the structure of page tables next week. And if you came in late and you missed it, actually, I can go over the assignment. But uh, oh, I think I'll wait and go over the assignment next week as well. So we're going to supposed to go over the assignment on main memory because I haven't finished. There's a couple more main memory schemes to go over. But uh, if you came in late and you missed it, the final exam for this course is going to be held on two separate days. The original day is Monday, August um, August 19th. If you want to show up at 11 in the morning on August 19th, you can take the OS exam on that day. If not, it will be offered on the 21st as well. The EM exam will also be offered on Monday if you want to take it. So if you want to take them all on Monday on the very same day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, you may do that. Otherwise, I'm going to have a time on Wednesday, probably in the morning, that'll be the makeup time for both of them. So you can use the makeup time to take one of them and then use Monday to take the other one. Or you can take them both on Monday. Or you can take them both on Wednesday. Your choice. The Wednesday time I don't have yet because I have to schedule it with the, uh, the people, the academic, whatever, the, the exam taking people. They do the surveys and stuff. And I have to make sure they're available. So I will announce the time for the Wednesday exam closer to it. But no, you have the option of taking it on Wednesday if you'd like. Okay. Yes, both of them. So you, this is the operating system class right now. If you're in the engineering management class, same concept. You can take them on Monday. You can take them on Wednesday. You can take them both on Wednesday, both on Monday, one on Monday, the other one on Wednesday, vice versa. OK, we're all done for today. Now you can talk. <laughs> doesn't stop anybody from talking. <laughs>